My name is Ariel Posen. I'm a singer-songwriter and guitar player. Before becoming an artist, I spent the majority of my career being a guitar player for artists, for bands, in the studio, and on the road. Once I began my own solo career, I realized that I was shaped by my experience and that there were some interesting stories to tell. I wanted to ask a few colleagues and friends of mine who have had a somewhat similar but different road about their story and their experiences. I think there's a bigger story to tell here, and I think this is something that can be really helpful to a lot of musicians and artists on a similar path. So without further ado, on today's episode we have Alexa Dirks, also known as Begonia. I actually don't know this, but what initially drew you into becoming a musician or like specifically like a performer, like a performing musician, like what inspired you? Um, well, I think I always had a taste for attention in the, the stage as a child. And, and I remember just like going to a smaller elementary school and auditioning, like for like being encouraged, like in being in the choir and being encouraged to audition for little things like in like the second grade, like we had little school musicals and stuff like that. And just feeling kind of getting a taste for that. I remember feeling like there's something interesting about this life that I'm very curious about, but I didn't understand. Like I didn't have anyone around me that was a performer. I didn't know, like I knew in my head from what I saw on TV and stuff, like what a life that would be. But like, I didn't necessarily have like an, an example in my life of someone who did that. So I didn't necessarily understand that it was like a realistic thing to do, but I just wanted to, I just put myself out there in every way possible. And I remember seeing, did, did you ever remember the artist Charlotte Church? She was like an 11 year old. Well, like what we were the same age and she was like a child prodigy opera singer. And I remember like watching like a special about her when like she was like 11 and I was like 11 and it was on Christmas Eve and like we're in my parents basement and we're watching as a family and she's like oh baby or whatever she was singing like a child and I just watched and I remember going up to my room after and just crying like bawling my face off and not and being so confused like I want to be her and it just like tore me apart but I didn't understand like just such big emotions anyways whatever just since I was a kid, I always had that desire in me. Nice. So then, so what happened? Like you, you were a kid, you got inspired early. How did your shift in career direction begin for you? To music, um, of course. I mean. Yes. In school, I was like in some praise and worship bands. Christian schools, bro. And so then there was like a guidance counselor who saw me perform and was like, hey, like, I know this guy. His name's John Fuller. He kind of has like a band of like teenagers. I want you to audition for this band. It put like sing, sing on a tape, basically. Record yourself on a tape and give me this tape and I'll give it to this John Fuller guy who like runs this band. I was like, that sounds cool. Like, I'll try anything. And I did. And then like six months later, he called me. He's like, join this band. And that was my first kind of um, like education into like a world of actually being on stage. Like I remember how getting a lesson on how to coil cables properly when I was like 16, like stuff like that where it's like, okay, so not only am I learning like how to perform, but learning like how to like be on the road, like without being on the road. But like, or that's what I thought at the time. I'm like, I'm learning all the ins and outs. Like I know how to coil a cable. Like I know how to do all the stuff that like singers don't normally get to know, like stuff like that, whatever. Like I just felt like I was getting an insider scoop on stuff in a way, <laughs> but whatever. And then uh, I started like when I was 18, like going to like the King's Head, watching like live bands there and then meeting and started a band with Joey, Megan, Ryan. But actually before that band, and that's where I met you in the yeah. above the Goodwill in the practice spaces with a band called BSC, Bachelors of Science. And that's where Indeed. I first met you in that practice space. And you just like came in and I felt like you already knew how to be how to be the person that did music like professionally and you were in school i think at the time like maybe i might have been that might have been my one year of uh 
don't know what I'm doing with my life. I feel like you were in school at the time. And I was like, oh, musicians go to school. Like I was just so much information was like coming, like flying in my face. Like, but yeah, that was my first foray into like doing like more covers and stuff. And then I started and that band didn't last super long. And we did like events and stuff and like birthday parties and like whatever, like weddings, like stuff like that. And so that just like threw me into this world of being adaptable really quickly, learning how to sing, like, cause I didn't have formal education. So then playing all those covers was like an education, like in real time, like learning what my voice could and couldn't do, trying to emulate other people. And yeah, just meeting people, like meeting people that were actually trying to do it, which is not like a crew. I didn't really know it people like that from high school and stuff like I didn't have examples and then I started meeting all these people and I was like okay they're like around my age they're doing this so it's possible like what yeah anyways long answer but there you go well no that's I think that's just the beginning of the answer so yeah I exactly I remember we met yeah like maybe 2005 or 2006 or something like that and yeah we we were doing a bunch of event band gigs (laughs) And you were doing Little Boy Boom, which was like some original material, some mostly like obscure covers. Yeah. Uh, we also had a band called The New Lightweights. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is technically still a band. We just never do anything. And, <laughs> you know, I, I recall us doing a lot of writing and you were doing a lot of songwriting or, or you were starting to do a lot more writing mm-hmm. at that time. Yeah. yeah. And the next thing, I, f- I feel like a year, within a year of you doing all these bar band gigs, you joined a band. Yes. So I was in Little Boy Boom and then I heard of this other band in town of like older musicians. It's called Magic Eye and they were a vocal group and people were like, oh yeah, I've heard of them. Like they had kind of like a reputation, like a positive reputation in the city and I knew who they were. And I had heard that they needed another vocalist. Like there was like an an open audition. Like I saw it on MySpace. And it was like... So 2000. (laughs) Exactly. It was like an open audition thing. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love singing. I want to... Like, I was just so open to it. But then also had this like commitment to this bar band, Little Boy Boom. And it was like very stressful. But then I was given this opportunity with this band that didn't have a name yet. Like these women, they started coming to my gigs and were like, hey, we want to... Magic Eyes actually breaking up. The audition is no longer, but we've been seeing you play and we want to start a new band and we want to know if you want to be a part of it. We already have all these gigs booked from our last band. We're just trying to like pick up these gigs. So we have one in California. It was like a 19 year old like, wow. So it's like basically choose this, choose this gig, this path of travel and or like uh, continue to cultivate this bar band, which I, which I loved. Like it meant everything to me at the time. But then it was just this, like, I like was asking everyone for advice. I was like up at late at night, just like crying all the time. It was a really difficult decision for me to finally decide, like to go with this band that at the time just felt like it had more uh, touring opportunity, just more adventure, like right there to grab and I was like okay I'm going for it so then when Little Boy Boom kind of was defunct and then I started touring with them I remember Ryan being like well let's still like make music together in a different capacity I know that you have this desire to like make more kind of like alt indie kind of country for lack of a better word or like Americana kind of music and he's like I know the perfect guitarist for the job like Ryan kind of orchestrated that like band starting in a way the That's new true, lightweights yeah, for sure. and then got us together and I was like yes and it totally just scratched an itch for me that whenever I was off tour and you were super busy like doing like what were you doing at the time I feel like you I were I think I was hustling. really doing any traveling I think I was just like the in town yes man <laughs> you know what I mean yeah def- every definitely. gig every possible gig every day every night in town. It was great. Well, and I, I felt like I still was trying to keep my foot in that door because I wasn't ready to just let go of saying yes to all the random bar gigs and all the wedding gigs. Just the op- that felt just like opportunities to meet people to get better. Like, so I was kind of like running myself to the ground, like touring with 
Shit Gemin was what that band became. And then flying home to play at Finn McHugh's till three in the morning because it felt so important that I st- still was like a part of the scene in a way. It felt so important to me. So I would be like spending money I didn't have to just fly, to fly home from like this big tour to play this bar gig because it was like everything to me to like still. For 75 bucks. For yeah, for like for like sixty bucks and a handshake, basically, <laughs> and and no one there, like so, or sometimes like you never. It was a mixed bag. Like sometimes there would be like a full crowd, but are they there for you or not? And sometimes there'd be like no one there. Your priorities are all seem like they've always been about you know making the right decision <laughs> for your career, but also like making the right decision in like your social circle and not like burning bridges and like you're really concerned about what your friends that you're involved with, like how they feel too. So, which I, which I think is really important because I feel like so many people, uh, you know, are just career minded first and they're like, what a collateral damage if I lose some friends, whatever, right. you know? Right. So I think that's really, you know, that's a, that's a really nice thing. Um, so you started, I mean, obviously Shik, I mean, was, was, was essentially so full time. Like mm-hmm. you'd you would you would come back to town. I remember whenever we would play a gig or like do a little session, it was only when you were in town <laughs> off the road from Chicamine. Yeah. And you did that for a very long time. Like eight years. Eight years. Eight years. Yeah. yeah. So I mean I know about this, but tell tell me about when how did like the shift in career direction happen from Chicamine to where you're where you're at now? So, I mean, you, you know, better than a lot of people, like in the, it, behind the scenes, like even throughout all of Shit Gemin, I was always working on music that wasn't for that band. Like that band was awesome in the way that it was so democratic. And we like, you would bring a few, so- like me as an individual would bring a few songs to the band. And then like the other four vocalists and writers would bring a song to the band or three like we'd all bring songs to the band so you would bring four songs and maybe only one would make it to the record because everyone else like everyone would kind of have their say and everyone's voice would be heard which I which I loved like it it made sense for that band but then that meant that I had like three or four songs out of five on the cutting room floor not understanding where to put them but they still like belong to me and and I would just have these ideas and I would send even on the road like I would send you like voice memos and then you'd send me back something with a guitar over it like every once in a while like and I and so I felt like I started getting comfortable kind of writing with you and with Matt Schellenberg like outside of that context and it kind of developed my confidence that like okay I do have an a, another voice outside of the band voice like that I have a desire to express myself like but it just never felt like the right timing to like fully step out on my own because I was so focused on the success of that band that it, if ever I were to like put too much time into my own personal stuff, I would feel like this sort of like I was cheating on them or something. Like I just could never go like too far down that road. But then it like – it was like a natural progression. Like the band just kind of got to a point where everyone was like, Hey, we had a great run. We want to still love each other. Let's like shake hands. And, and it, it was never this, like we never even made like a formal thing online being like, shit, Gemin is now broken up. Like it was just something that was like this very emotional, beautiful conversation between us and it was personal and it was just like this mutual respect of like hey like we've been we've been at this for eight years sometimes it's been easy sometimes it's been like bashing our heads against a brick wall (laughs) and let's let's call it like in in a in a respectful way like before it gets to the point where it just feels like why are we doing this anymore you know like and I and I feel like it all just kind of ended in this like difficult but natural kind of way and then for me it almost felt like okay I was like I gave myself like the blessing to like move forward and I wasn't ready to be off the road like when we were like hey we're gonna call it I was like yeah and then I realized oh shit okay 
now like does that mean my touring's done does that mean like like how do I how do I move on and then just through like talking to different pals and like you really encouraged me and I didn't necessarily have like the full confidence but I knew that I had to keep going I just wasn't ready to just stop and and for better or for worse like sometimes when I reflect on starting begonia immediately I think like wow if I would have taken like maybe a little bit of a break that could have been positive for my mental health but no regrets like but I did just go straight into it it was like I was off the road with them and then I was writing and I was in the studio and I was making an EP and then I had like that was the first time in my adult life that I like took a a job I worked as a waitress for a server rather a cocktail server for a moment which is so out of my comfort zone like I don't have a resume folks like it was not it was like a pal who was like hey you seem like you'd be a good surfer I'm starting a cocktail bar like come on down I'm like do you know me like I don't have a I don't don't have jobs like I don't know how to have a job but that was like in the interim like and then it kind of felt like I was starting from scratch again like I had built up this whole career all these contacts and then there I was right back again trying to just like make not trying to make a name for myself but just trying to like do something that I was proud of on my own and it was scary it was difficult yeah for sure um that kind of answers one of the next questions like if you were self-motivated or urged by other parties and I know it was like kind of it was a mixed bag it was a little of both totally so and I always like lacked a bit of confidence like and you know like I would be like I want to do this, but I am the kind of person that needs a lot of like outside validation. <laughs> I remember telling you, I mean, I can only really refer to my own experience in in this subject with you. It's like, I do remember telling you numerous times or trying to, I remember a couple of gigs mm-hmm. driving back like from Brandon. What's, I remember what's the, that uh, too. Where's the uh, oh, or like Alt- Steinbeck maybe or something? Steinbeck or like what's the what's the place we always play in near Brandon? In the Boys nice coffee shop. Boys of Vane. The song. And I remember I, a whole car ride. We sat in the back, and I was the whole time was like t- telling you you should do that. I know. Um, and I remember but there was many at that times time like too. That. I was like uh, dating a lot of random people, and you were just like, I like you. I remember this so vividly. You're like, stop wasting your time. Like, why are you wasting your time? Like putting your focus into all these random dudes. Like, just start focusing on your music. Like you were just like, not in a rude way. Like you were just giving me some truth. And I was like, that it stuck. That stuck with me. I don't know if I've ever fully expressed that to you. Cause I was no. like, oh, this guy. And it was kind of just like funny to me. And you were just like, yeah, like that sounds fun. But like also, like there's this. Like you could not waste your time doing that. Like there's so much more shit that you could be like putting your energy into. I'm like, stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I, okay, I remember so, that exact car ride too. I absolutely yeah. do. How memories. <laughs> um, so tell me, describe the steps you took when it when it came to finally making that first record or first EP, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so it was kind of a... It, Matt Schellenberg was... I had been writing with him for years as well in a project called Courier News, which was a very side project that kind of allowed me to get more of that like indie like kind of bedroom dreamy kind of stuff out of me in a way and he was experimenting with different production and stuff and so we had been writing some stuff that I felt like kind of felt the most like the way I wanted to move forward uh stylistically and then I don't it's like I don't even remember exactly how it happened but then we got Matt Peters on board and the three of us I had a very small budget and the three of us just went into private ear in Winnipeg and just made it like allotted five days for five songs and just made it happen like and and that's I feel like that's a common thread in my career life is just even when I don't know sometimes what I'm doing I just like set goals or set deadlines and it's not I'm not like a five-year goal projection kind of person but I'm definitely like a 
okay, I'm going to make studio time. I think I'm almost ready. I'm going to make studio time for five months from now and then I'll be ready. Like I'll make myself ready because I'm, if I don't make those kinds of hard deadlines, like I can just sit there and think and overthink and talk myself out of and like, like I need, I need those kinds of, so that's something that I started doing. So we like made kind of a time, okay, we're going to write songs. Then we made a time we're going to go into the studio because I knew I just needed that push forward. And we made the five song EP, which like was very all over the place, which is fine. And like now I look back and obviously you look back and you're like, I would never do it the same way, but I'm glad that we did it that way. And one of the songs ended up getting picked up by uh, one of the CBC producers, like who was kind of putting new music on the radio. So then Juniper like got put on the radio and then suddenly it was just like this new game for me. And I was like, oh, got my first gig and you played on my first gig. That's right. And like putting a band together, but that like made me want to vomit. Like not you being on the gig, <laughs> but like just me being a band leader. Like I, it's not like I had never kind of like dabbled in that, but it was never all on me. It's like even in the lightweights, it was you and me and Ryan, but like like it wasn't like it was all on me. Like no, it's a huge like, shift. It was a shift and I and I didn't feel it really just like illuminated all of my deep insecurities. Like everything that I like I remember setting up the first rehearsal and, and it was like these are all my friends. Like these are all my friends. It was you, Alex Campbell, Ryan Voth, Heather, Jason else maybe that was it yeah it was was like it was like like all my my best like all my great pals but I was just so nervous and so nervous to look stupid to not know what I was talking about like and I remember asking you like I I relied on you like what are what are the keys of my songs like just like making like just I want to know I want to have like a quick sheet like of anything of any little (laughs) so I can just answer and before the rehearsal I just like was ill like because I was so nervous yeah it's a huge shift I mean going yeah (laughs) Uh, understandable I mean if you don't feel like that I feel like you don't care enough that like there couldn't be a more bigger sign of like you care so deeply about this seriously and that's a good thing okay so yeah first gig EP Starting to see some, I think everything can be considered a success. Even a first gig is a success. You got to take your wins when they come, right? Absolutely. Fast forward, you start touring more. Mm -hmm. You make a full length record. Mm -hmm. Um, More touring, you start seeing the growth. It's all great. Now that you've spent considerable time, you know, on both sides. So solo artist fully and band member, but also like... Yeah, just let's just say band member. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, do you have any grand insight into the music industry that you think would benefit <laughs> others who are like pursuing success in a similar path or not even pursuing success, but just doing the thing, you know? Even down to just like team members, for example, like my manager now, Stu, like uh, I knew him already because he was my past band's ag- agent. Like, so I had a context for him. Like it felt... It did feel like every kind of brick that was laid without thinking about it definitely set me up for where I am now. Like, I can't mm-hmm. say that that's not like and and sometimes I think about like, oh, what would have happened if I would have gone solo earlier? Da, 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 da. Or I used to think about that. I don't think about that as much anymore, but I, I used to. But it's just kind of futile in a way because I I would not have given up any of those tour experiences, any of the knowledge that I gained, like I wouldn't have, I don't think I was ready before I was ready. If that makes sense. Like I would, I wouldn't have been, I, I, it would have, whatever, it would have happened, whatever. But it's like, I, I don't, I'm just happy with kind of like how I felt more equipped. I mean, there's always things change, right. And the industry shifts and standards shift and whatever. So you're always learning new things. And I feel like the more I put myself out there, like something that was really new to me in the Begonia era, like when I started Begonia was like making, like producing music videos, producing shows, like getting more kind of behind 
that and really enjoying that collaborative process because I knew kind of the collaborative process in a musical sense, but I hadn't really dove into more of the visual kind of like the, the, the whole like full circle creative side. And that was something that was really new. And then figuring out standards for like budgets, like di- just like really logistical kind of things that I maybe wasn't as privy to before. So I still feel like I'm learning new things constantly. But with that base level of like confidence and knowledge that it's like I'm not coming at this from a completely uh, new like green perspective. But yeah, whenever I get asked to like men- like do mentoring things or do talks, like I – feel like I'm not a teacher like I or I feel like I don't know shit and then I get into these environments with like younger musicians and I'm like oh like my experience is worth something like because I still feel like I'm learning all the time so I forget all the things that I already innately kind of know in a way and that just comes from experience and whenever like like if there's ever like advice or whatever for like younger musicians I'm always just like well and now it's hard because of pandemic but I'm always like just get out and play like don't have an ego like just get out and play play everywhere anywhere whatever you can like any experience that you can get under your belt uh yeah just don't be afraid to ask questions be stupid that's something that I maybe would have wished I could have given advice to my younger self it's like you don't have to you're learning you don't have to know everything right off the bat you're not expected to so just ask more questions yeah that's great. I, I totally agree with you. Mm-hmm. Experience is experience. And like, how are you supposed to? Yeah. You, people, I think people are so afraid of like, not only promoting themselves, but like asking those questions. Yeah. And like seeming like they're, you know, just not intelligent enough or just don't know. They, they think they'll be looked down upon if they don't know right at the gate how yeah. to jump into an industry like this and do the thing. So yeah, love it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah love it <laughs> now how have your work priorities shifted just mm. looking back now and like what do you think about the most when it comes to a, a project uh I don't after putting out my first album well and I mean like the pandemic throws a wrench into all of this too right sure it's, so it's like I had my work priorities and I was hustling like hard and the priority before pre-pandemic was tour go grind like be as available as possible be as open to every opportunity like I that was something that coming out of the band like where you had where I had to have more of a democracy something that I said to myself at the beginning like I'm gonna say yes to everything but then I learned very quickly and this was something the first tour that I did with Serena Ryder like name drop but like she's a friend of mine but like anyways the first tour she kind of sat me down was like listen If you don't set boundaries for yourself, no one's going to do that for you. Like if you say, I'm available for everything, then people will say, great. Why don't you do this, this, and this? But if you don't say, like if if you don't choose your clock out times, choose when you're not going to maybe go to the merch table because you can't because your voice might blow out. Like if you don't make those decisions for yourself, no one's going to do that for you. And that really stuck with me because I am such a yes person. And that was something I decided I wanted to be. But then combined with that, I'm also like anxious, like a bit of a people pleaser to like the detriment of myself sometimes where it's like I will go blow out my voice because like I want to like be available. Like I don't want to miss those opportunities, but it's like, wait a minute. So like who's taking care of me then? So I feel like I'm shifting like and that was something that I thought I was doing better at. But then when the pandemic hit and I was literally like like ill and so tired so burnt out like and that's whatever I was so burnt out but like I was and I didn't really know I was just on this hamster wheel and I didn't want to stop because I wanted that momentum to keep growing and I didn't want to be the reason why the momentum wasn't growing like you don't want to wake be up at night being like oh I said no to that random thing maybe that would have been the random thing that would have gotten me this other random thing but like I don't feel like I've been saying no a lot more <laughs> things and just following like my mental health, like trying to take care of myself and feeling that like I just don't ever want to be in that position again where I feel that sense of urgency so hard that I sacrifice creatively what I want, that I 
don't put in the proper time like to make things that I'm proud of. Not that I like, I feel like I've always been kind of good at that, but I just felt myself starting to get to that point where it's like, yes to everything. And now I just feel like, pardon me, I'm taking a step back and I'm like, okay, let's, let's try to evaluate like what, not only what you want your life to be, but because for me, my life and my career is like so intrinsically, intrinsically linked that it just feels like if I don't make those decisions more thoughtfully, like what is my life (laughs) going to be just an onward, like just an ongoing hustle. Like that just doesn't appeal to me, but I want to continue to strive to do better, but I just, there's just like that balance that I'm always trying to achieve that has just like there's been a light kind of shone on it in the last year of like okay well if you want to achieve that like you got to work at achieving that yourself like you can't just wait for it to happen like sure if that makes sense yeah totally uh how much of your work would you qualify now as innovative and like in, in in such a closed mar- modern market, you know, where there's so many genres and micro micro genres, like how are you trying just to keep what you do fresh oh, and like man, what that's... you're putting out fresh? Yeah, I'm I'm a very like that's that's tough because I'm definitely not the kind of person that feels confident enough to be like I'm breaking the molds. Like sure. you gotta listen to me. Like I just am trying to like stay in my lane and do what I do the best that I can and follow like my uh, emotional compass. Like I'm, I'm the kind of person because I'm definitely not super academic about music. I'm not really trained. Like I'm trained through life, like, but I'm not like opening a book, like knowing what I'm looking at basically. (laughs) And so, and that used to be a huge, um, insecurity of mine and something that I wouldn't necessarily readily admit uh as much because I would feel like oh that already gives me like a what's the opposite of a leg up a leg down I don't know but like now I feel like that's something that I'm kind of seeing as my it's just my own personal voice it's my it's my it not necessarily even advantage it's just it's who I am and you and that's also something if I'm talking to like younger artists it's like there's nobody who is you so you can try to be someone else and people will see that but you are the only person that can tell your story you're the only person that can be yourself and there are a bunch of people like there are other people doing their own thing but you don't got to touch that you don't have to try and steal anything from other people you don't have to touch that like you you are your own individual naturally you get inspired by other people and that's like the world and that's music and whatever but I'm just trying to like follow the compass I just want to be authentic like I'm working on a record right now and I think the thing that like keeps me up at night or like that I keep wrestling with is like I just want this to impact people in a way that it's just like authentic and real and the emotional connection so I just try to follow my instincts the best that I can. And sometimes it's hard for me to pinpoint why I like something or why I don't like something, but I just know when I do. (laughs) Yeah. That's gotta be honest and genuine at the end of the day. That's the, if you don't believe it, why would anyone else? That's kind of it. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel like it takes, it takes, even if you have like your voice, so to speak, right out the get go, it takes a, it takes a while to find it. Even like I, I feel the same way like you know you put out a first record and you've definitely evolved from it but like you wouldn't be where you are without it like you have to you have to have that and uh i don't think you have to find your voice or your your sound or your thing right out the get-go and you know what it can always change too i don't think there's like a specific rule to it and when you're a fan of someone you want to like or or you're interested in that evolution you know, yeah. like, and, and, it, and I remember before I put out my first EP, I was like, oh, is this the thing I'm going to be the most proud of? Like talking to Stu and being like, I don't know if I'm ready to put this out because what if it's not the best I can do? And yeah. he's like, but you have to start your journey somewhere. Like, exactly. And, and if you're proud of this and you want to put it out, let's put it out. And then you can work on another thing. And that can be the next best thing you do. And then you work on another thing. And why would, as an artist... Why would you not want to evolve? Like, why would you want to make the same thing over and over again? It's interesting because when you put out your first record, then people have kind of like a barometer for who you are. 
Like then they totally. then they're like, oh, this is what you do. So then if you do evolve, it can be scary because you're like, well, that's what I did then. But now yeah. I'm doing something like a little bit different. And what if you would have put out that record first or whatever? Then people would have had a different kind of like way of viewing you. Like it is this whole like mind uh, thing that you yeah. have to just like try to silence the voices and just like move forward. But I agree totally. with you where it's like I, and I know that it's kind of like a trend to kind of delete your back catalog and just like rebrand and start over. And, and while I respect that, like, cause everyone has their reasons for me personally, I feel like I, I am such a person that is just evolving in real time constantly. And I will continue to, and I hope that my first record doesn't sound like my last record and, and the through line will be my voice and that's fine with me. But like, also mm-hmm. like, I don't need to just like stay in one genre, try to be the same person like and I don't want to be. And I want people to see that because I want people to see that that's realistic that a human does that. Yeah. <laughs> but that's also part of like what I my like MO like in general anyway. So I I I don't like knock people for doing that, but I just couldn't see myself doing that. If that makes sense. Totally. So now that you have hindsight, would you have changed any of your decisions that led you to where you're at now? Would you have done anything differently? As Rascal Flatts once said, (laughs) God bless the broken road that led me straight to you, you being myself where I am now. I feel, no, I can't say that I would. Like, the, like I said before, maybe one of the things that I would have liked to, if I could sit my old self down, I'd be like, hey, you got it in you. Stop doubting yourself all the time. Ask those questions that you want to ask because you're going to regret later that you didn't ask them 10 years earlier. Like, why wait to ask something that you think? Like, just like encourage myself to just learn more, to not be afraid to learn and grow in certain ways. But I can't say that I would change. I I can't say that I would change anything because God bless the broken road that led me straight to you, as I said. You know. Love God it. God bless the broken road that led me straight to you. You know what I'm saying? Feel you know you. That song? Feel you. Yes. <laughs> um, that's all I got. Walk the line. Knowing it's not in fashion Heart on the sleeve of my satin blouse Going to your house Every night Looking for satisfaction You could be a lover But honestly I've had too many to count Part of me is over it Pretend I don't give a shit I answer your message You sit and I question Why people leave red receipts on I'm just a pawn in some game of love This isn't me at all I need to change it up I've seen that But it doesn't mean that much I can't fall asleep I may never get up into the night I think my time is up and I Sometimes mistaken for kindness But if I'm too kind, that's weakness Till I become blind and sleepless Can't treat this, so I'm faithful To those I feel deserve love But I guess that's everyone Not sure that I have enough Nobody made me feel this way And now I'll never be And I 
I've, 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 I